Tell me about, since we're on this addiction subject and all that, uh, smoking. Uh, I, I remember with a couple of parts, including Country Girl, I, uh, I would smoke a bit, and, and that was it. I said to this psychiatrist I was seeing, well, you told me I have addictive tendencies. <laughs> why, why, why aren't I, you know, I smoke, but when I'm done with the role, and with a Polish accent, he said, well, Mr. Howard, that's because you're not a smoker. I said, that's it? He said, that's it. Some people are, some people aren't. And really? be glad you're not, because that's maybe the hardest addiction of all. Of right? all. That's what he said. It was amazing. He said, Just You're not a smoker. I'm not a smoker. I mean, I did it when we, you know, in that role, and when I did yeah. Equus, I smoked some, but it's just not in me, thank God. But I know well, that you always fought it, but you'd smoke, uh, and then you'd stop. And you know, I've had it. heroin addicts tell me that smoking was harder than heroin. I went, I went to everything. I once went to a, was a place called Schick. I tried them. They put you in a room the size of a phone booth with a huge... A uh, wash tub full of sand, and they say we want you to smoke an entire pack of cigarettes as fast as you can. So you do it, and you salivate. You get dizzy, and ill. And I smoked the entire pack. And I stepped outside and said, "Boy, that was a uh, that was tough." <laughs> and I lit a cigarette. <laughs> they gave me my money back. I was hoping you'd tell that story because you told me that, <laughs> it's and it's just great. it's just wonderful. But finally, uh, it just kind of went away, as did the alcohol. The desire for it just fell away, and it stopped satisfying me, and it was just gone. I don't know why that happened, but I'm very lucky. Well, you're healthy and always very fit and trim, and now yet another new phase of your life, life not only with the, the, the Fantastics, which I just love, because I saw when you were first starting, I don't know if you remember, but out in Malibu, and you were starting to rehearse, and I got to watch you one afternoon. That's right, yeah. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. And that's a wonderful idea. And along with that, this uh, whole, I don't know how many careers you've had, but you know, your 14th <laughs> career. And also, just recently married to Arlene. Yes. And uh, my wife Linda was there, and it was, uh, I've seen the tapes of it. It was a joyous occasion, great fun. It was fun. a fun. fairy tale. That a whole, fairy tale. Oh, what a, it was the best wedding I've ever been to. So what does that feel like? I mean, oh, now as you unbelievable. I, I am not a loner. I, you know, I lost uh, two wives uh, to cancer. And I had one year of living alone, and I said, this isn't going to do. I cannot live alone. Some people can. I have to have a partner in life. Right. And I met at the SAG Awards. Right. I met Arlene. And the first time in my life I ever hit on a woman. <laughs> I actually sat down and said, hi, my name's Dick. <laughs> and her comeback was, won't you win Mary Poppins or something? <laughs> oh, this is going to be a tough road. <laughs> but I finally won her over. Oh, God, it's fun. And the, the three guys I sing with are half my age, right. and they keep me young. Tell me a little bit about the uh, foundations you're working on, because I know there's, uh, well, you talk about it, there's Ray's Syndrome and there's uh, well, self therapy. Uh, my big interest is the Midnight Mission right. downtown. Right. I've been with them, oh, gosh, about 15 years now. I started going down as a volunteer, and somehow or another, I slowly became the maitre d'. <laughs> <laughs> I, I greet people coming in, I table hop, I sit and talk to people, sing a little, dance, and just entertain. So I go Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving, and uh, I become an old hand at it. And I'm also the, the fundraising chairman, and we, about three years ago, built a new Midnight Mission. Right. And it's in, it, people think, you know, we just feed and clothe and house the homeless. We educate them, clean them up, and and put them back into society. Clean up and get them jobs. That's the the difference between we become a model for the rest of the country. The process: a guy goes in, he starts by mopping the kitchen, and they moves up, you know, into finally into an office position. Our third floor is all little apartments, where a guy gets a job. He still lives at the mission until he's on his own feet. And he reports back there. Oh, and every year we have a graduating class of guys all spruced up who are going back out in the world. It's really satisfying to see. Tell us a little bit about uh, the beginnings and then the fruition of your wonderful relationship with Mary Tyler Moore in your oh. show. Should I tell you, that woman could do anything. When I first met her, the first thing I said to Carl was, isn't she a little young? She 
considerably younger than me. And she had a kind of a mid-Atlantic accent, kind of a Catherine Hepburn thing. Right. And I said, can she, can she do comedy, do you think? Well, it wasn't three shows before she grabbed it. You know, we had Maury Amsterdam. We had Rosemary, me, and Carl. And she just drank it in. And the timing, the whole sense of it. We became an improv group. Mary and I could read each other's minds. We, we could, if we needed to improvise a scene, we could have done it. It was such a joy working with her. It was wonderful to watch. I, I think p p most of America can still hear her going, Rob, you know. <laughs> I know. I know. She coined that phrase. You, you, you go ahead. Well, I'm really going to say the, the extreme compliment. That most people in the public thought we were really married. Yeah. Right. They had that impression, so I think we did something right. You know, it's, it's endured so well and still lives up uh, so well when I see it. it just, it's, it's got that spontaneity and life to it. I remember in, uh, well, it was 30 years ago, and we were working together, and you said something to me I never forgot. You were, and you were already white-haired, <laughs> and, uh, and we were chatting about things. And, and I asked you if you ever watched reruns of, of your show. And you said, uh, or I, you, you said, well, I'm, I've never been good at watching myself. I don't really enjoy that. You said, but sometimes it'll be on late at night, and I'll look at it, and I'll think, that skinny, dark-haired <laughs> young guy is really funny. <laughs> it's like you had enough time to just <laughs> yeah. value it. I thought that was sweet and probably Isn't very it amazing true. amazing? Uh, something you weren't very fond of. 10 or 15 years later, you look at it and say, well, that, that wasn't so bad. That so bad. <laughs> yeah, you don't pick yourself apart. Now, in terms of uh, that being a great hit, and I know you, the show ended right at the peak. I mean, it's kind of yeah, remarkable. Yeah, Carl didn't want to do more than five. None of us would have ever left. But it, I think in some ways it was great because you did so many marvelous things and had so many opportunities. And then... Uh, and then, of course, came, uh, as you call it, the height of nepotism. When you tell us about diagnosis murder and how it started, and and how it took off. Well, it was uh, uh, Freddie Silverman, who right. had been the head of of uh, CBS, was a producer of uh, Jake and the Fat Man. You know, it was a series with oh god, I can't think of his name. Uh, Bill uh, uh, Bill Conrad. Bill Conrad. Right. And he said, "I want to do a spinoff," and I said. Freddie, I'm 65 years old. Why would I want to do an hour series? He said, well, I just want you to help me sell it. All you have to do is just do the pilot. So we did the pilot, and they picked up a couple of movies of the week. And Freddie was like, the, what is the Arab and the camel in the tent? Just do these two. That's, That's all right. I'm asking. <laughs> just do. So we did the two movies. Then they picked it up as a show. But I think they did maybe eight, you know, and we said, well, well. But well, they kept frittering us away that way for 10 years. They pick up 11 and then a couple more. And as you said, it was just under the radar. The ratings were healthy enough to keep us on the air, but we weren't like number one or anything. Right. So we just kind of floated along. And it was a joy for me to do because they let me, if I wanted to be funny and keep it light, right. we tried to run a loose ship and, and make it light. And I thought it was different than the other murder mysteries because we weren't particularly cool, any of us. It was. And it was also a family affair. You had Barry and it was, it was all that. I had my stuff. son and I uh, used all my grandkids. All the grandkids. My daughter, Stacy. I think I used about everybody on that show, which made it fun for Marvelous. me. Marvelous. Well, sometimes I just love uh, rehearing some stories that you've told me over the years. And I remember when you were on uh, in Bye Bye Birdie and you'd won the Emmy and were uh, the toast of Broadway. And uh, at the time when you got caught in traffic and couldn't get to the theater and your understudy, Charles would, you tell us that? would you tell us all oh, that? I mean, it was one of the funniest performances I've ever seen. Charles Nelson Riley, who he was on uh, J uh, Ghost of Mrs. Muir and he was on a lot of talk shows. Very talented, but he did not sing and he didn't dance. He was 6'4 and uh, had never learned the lines even. He didn't ever expect to have to go on. Well, he, he walked out and I got there about halfway through the first act in my suit, which came up to here on him, my little hat on his head, and he started <laughs> saying, uh, put on a happy face. Gray skies are gonna clear up, Fasu Subad Day. And he 
ad-libbed his way through a two-hour show, <laughs> and the audience were dying. He brought the house down. He was so funny. I mean, the show was a shambles as far as the story and the score went. <laughs> but my God, what an evening in the theater it was. I love that story. Just great. And of course, that was an Emmy, and you've also, uh, as the line goes, it's, uh, you know, this is my first award, so please be kind. Well, it's not your first award, the Life Achievement <laughs> Award. You won an Emmy. You won a Grammy. Yeah. Tell us about the Grammy, first of all. Well, I got a call one day that said, we're having a reunion of, of the Grammy winners. Can you attend? And I said, I, I don't have a Grammy. Never got one. And they said, well, yeah, you got one, and so and so and so. I called up Julie Andrews, and I said, did you know you got a Grammy? She said, no. It turned out they had never notified us. For, I think it was because uh, Mary Poppins' album went platinum or whatever it is. So I said, I'll come to the reunion if you'll give me my Grammy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went and I got my Grammy now sitting on the piano. So uh, that's how I kind of out of left field won a Grammy. Tell us a little bit, too, because you mentioned the, the marvelous Julie Andrews, what that was like working with her. We're back oh. to Mary Poppins. But. I mean, she, was, she had some mischief in her, but she was just the lady, you think. What my problem is that anybody from the U.K. Gets, sees me, I hear about my Cockney accent. <laughs> they won't let me off the hook about that. <laughs> well, not. And I said, the, they gave me a guy named Pat O'Malley, an Irishman, as my coach. So he wasn't any better than I was. But I said I was too busy learning to dance and sing and do all the other stuff. But they won't let me off the hook about that accent. I'll never hear the end of it. I think it's perfect because it's you <laughs> being know. that. And everybody knows it. And it's a great American yeah. classic. Oh, boy. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. I was wondering if you'd share with us, uh, you had told me about how so much of your career was, uh, was a matter of on-the-job training. Yes, I think that's what I had anxiety most of my career because I was never ready. I never expected to act or sing or dance. I thought I was going to be a TV announcer. So I got a job singing and dancing on Broadway. I wasn't ready. I didn't know how. And I got the show, of the Dick Van Dyke show. I had never acted. And I, we have a hit show and I'm learning to act as I went. I had one acting lesson. Of, of, who was the executive producer of all those shows? Sheldon Leonard. Sheldon Leonard. Ah. You know how we talk like that. Came up to me one day and he said, Dick, you're talking in a monotone. Make your voice go up and down more. And I did, and everything was fine after that. <laughs> it was my, my one acting lesson. <laughs> well, you're an inspiration to all of us. You're a perfect recipient of the SAG After Life Achievement Award because, as we said earlier, you have done it all. And for uh, somebody who thought they were going to be an announcer, things have turned out just fine. Oh, I mean, like this award, it's, such, it's out of the blue. It's such a surprise. And what a nice cherry on top of everything. It's well, just it's wonderful. A, it's a gift to you, but you are such a gift to us. Thank you so much for Thank coming you, to Ken. do this. Thank you, Thank you. Let's do something together. I love it. <laughs>